So you want to know what ranged weapons are good or bad in Dead Cells? Well, you come to the right place, but first I want to go through what my criteria for my ratings... Well, actually it's a good thing that you watched the melee tier list already since I've already gone over the criteria back there. So let's just skip the introduction and get straight into it. What a way to start off this list than the legendary Alchemic Carbine. It has infinite ammo, arguably the best poison-afflicting weapon in the game. You press the attack button and watch everything die. I'm not exaggerating when I say this, but a lot of times when I run this weapon with another, the other weapon becomes pretty much obsolete because of just how much damage this does. It's a staple of this tactics playstyle, and I wouldn't be surprised if the carbine wasn't on the items that will receive nerfs in the future. In fact, it already was. It really goes to show just how powerful DLT effects are in Dead Cells. Now, it should be said before going further into this video that on average, ranged weapons will be better than melee weapons. This is because Tactics Builds has the least amount of HP compared to the other colors, but it is a high-risk, high-reward playstyle. So the weapon will most likely reflect this. But because of a damage nerf, the Alchemic Carbine gets lowered to A+. As mentioned previously, Tactics is all about high risk, high reward, but the barrel launcher crosses that line just a little bit. After a short windup, you will launch a bouncing barrel, and if the barrel bounces off a wall first, it will do a critical hit. The only problem is that if the enemy happens to be attacking, they can bounce the barrel back at you and make it hit you instead. Of course, you can always just hit it again and just play ping pong, but because the risk of the barrel backfiring exists, the barrel launcher will take some getting used to. However, Given that the damage on the crit is among the highest in the entire game, the reward of mastering this weapon is definitely worth it. A cheap strategy is to just camp near a wall and wait for enemies to come to you, but it won't work 100% of the time. I recommend running the Masochist Mutation one, as it actually caps the barrel that gets launched back at you to 10% of your health, because it actually counts as trap damage. Anything that can make it harder for foes to bounce your own barrel back at you is good, or just anything defensive. Very solid damage, gotta watch out a little bit in bosses, as the risk of using it knocks it down to a decent B tier. The blowgun has received some changes over the years, and one that was recently settled on was a version that also inflicts poison, because it didn't before. Now, I believe the blowgun is a downgrade from the assassin's dagger in pretty much every way possible. First, because it has ammo, if you run out, you are a sitting duck until it recovers automatically. Second, because it is a ranged weapon, making enemies face away from you from a distance is not very easy to do. Third, all the synergies the blowgun has are the same as the assassin's dagger, the obvious choice being phaser, but phaser will vastly benefit the assassin's dagger more than it does blowgun. Finally, I will admit the crit damage is very decent. A non-crit, on the other hand, does only so much as tickle enemies. One other thing I should say that applies to all ranged weapons is that there are very few ways to get your arrows back once you run out. You can either do a parry with a shield, grenades and some other select skills in the game can roll the return all arrows affix, or maybe with the ripper mutation. It's arguably better than the assassin's dagger when it actually works, but if you don't have a good setup, it kinda sucks. So it's kinda like an all or nothing weapon in that regard. I can see it being tacked as a support weapon to inflict poison, and because of the high potential, assuming that you actually get the crits, three years after the Bad Seed DLC, the blowgun finally gets promoted to B tier. The boomerang is in a very good place right now after a damage buff. While my first experience with it is a little rough, I quickly came to appreciate this weapon as one of the most solid support options in the game. You know when you're blasting away with your main weapon, it leaves very little time to use the other weapon in your slot? Well, with the boomerang, you can fill in that gap and achieve even higher damage. Quick bow, the multi-nox bow, the sonic carbine, it just goes on and on. So many bows you can combo the boomerang with. Throw your little friend, and as it chips away at the enemy's health, you get to spam your main bow or weapon on top of that. If you manage to land some decent affixes, the game is as good as one. This is probably going to be one of the more questionable placements, but I believe the Boomerang has what it takes to be S-tier material. The Bow and Endless Quiver has a fairly straightforward mechanic. It will never run out of arrows. The downside is, the damage is fairly lackluster. 
while every third hit will do a bit of bonus damage, it's unlikely that this bow will be able to close fights with elites and bosses as fast as other ranged weapons. While it performs fairly decently in the first two biomes, you will immediately start to see its potential drop off after that. A good strategy in tactics is to just double down on damage, so that every item you have will help you finish the fight before needing to do any defensive maneuvers. The bow and endless quiver sadly falls short of being able to do that. While it's definitely possible to brute force your way through the game by having busted support skills, a lot of synergies this bow has just doesn't benefit it as much as others. The bow's draw speed could also use a buff in my opinion, but for now, this weapon stays in C tier because of just how competitive tactics weapons are. The E-Whip is unlocked right as you boot up Dead Cells for the first time, and one weapon you probably tried at least once. You can really feel the speed and responsiveness on the whip, being able to stop attacking or change directions quickly. This weapon has been a staple for many years in Dead Cells, to the point of it being almost iconic. The whip has one of the few weapons able to inflict electricity damage, and very effective at doing it. Not only will it auto-target flying enemies, the shock DLT effect can finish off anything that you couldn't. It's a simplistic weapon to use, if not brainless, but even today, it still pulls its weight. A tier. With a bang, let's start off the two-handed weapons with the explosive crossbow. One of the buttons will fire a high damaging range shot, while the other just whacks things in melee range with the crossbow itself. There's not too much to say about it other than it's just independently strong. The ranged shot actually does more damage than the whack at the cost of ammo, but this weapon is good enough to get you through the game. However, that also means there aren't very noticeable synergies to really make it stand out. Just run whatever skills you want. Good weapon all around, but the lack of creativity bumps it down to an A tier. A weapon that we skipped in the melee tier list is the Ferryman's Lantern, so here it is. It's the first of the two-handed weapons that scale with brutality and tactics. Now, despite the fact that the components of the weapon consists of 50% melee and 50% ranged, you're most likely running this in brutality, because the rate at which you're going to use the weapon is like 80% with melee hits and 20% with the soul shot. The idea is to save up your souls for elites and boss fights, or just any time you feel overwhelmed. The Soul Shot has a wind-up and will deal crits if three or more were released. Now I won't lie, the damage potential of the Soul Shot is insane. However, a major thing that holds it back is that you can't manually aim projectiles in this game and must rely on the game to aim the shot for you. So my question is, what if your shots miss? May it be enemies moving away, or Hand of the King literally using a shield to completely negate the range shot, or just the Lantern's wonky AI acting up? Saving those souls for a long time just so it misses doesn't feel too good. It's a quirky weapon to try out at least once, and surprisingly, the ammo mutation actually lets you store double the amount of souls in the lantern. Not the best two-handed weapon in the game, but I can agree to a B+. Do you want insane damage potential? What about constant crits and easy synergies? Well, Fire Blast is here to trivialize your game. Regarded by some as possibly THE hardest hitting weapon in the game for the past years, this handy little portable flamethrower has your character stand in place while you roast your targets at an alarming speed. Since oil is rather easy to come by, you're pretty much guaranteed to get crits when you run this. The damage can be extended even further with Hokuto's bow, so roast away. I know there's still a bug in the game where you can just use the fire blast while moving, but I'm not gonna factor in glitches, since it's not an attentional feature. Even then, I'm willing to give the Fire Blast the Golden S tier. Firebrands is a neat little lighter that you probably played a couple times, just being a merit of unlocked by default. While it does a fairly decent job of doing what it does, as a support weapon, it gets a little outclassed by other options as your roster starts to expand. The main problem is that every time you use it, the effect is just so minor. Without dual binding, it's not really worth switching between your two weapons, just so you can get some extra burn damage in. Unless you'd like to give your fingers a workout. I can still use it as a placeholder for burn synergy until something better comes along, but ultimately, I'm gonna have to put this in B tier. I'm gonna take a shot in the dark and say that you've probably used the Frost Blast at least once when you started the game, and thought that it's one of the best weapons out there. And you'd be... almost right. In terms of freeze options, it's definitely one of the best ones. 
fast casting speed, and a generously big AoE effect. While the Frost Blast can work its magic very well in biomes, some bosses are resistant to being frozen, and some are just immune altogether. Sometimes it's just such a far cry on how it performs in bosses versus biomes that you end up completely unprepared in some circumstances. You also have to consider the fact that if enemies survive the freeze, they are slowed down and it can throw off your dodge patterns. Don't get me wrong, it's still a very good support for a lot of survival weapons, but because freeze doesn't work universally throughout your runs, it's still a overall B-tier support. Wow, talk about a total rework. In addition to being buffed on numerous occasions, the Gilded Yumi has been completely reworked in the latest patch. Now only armed with two shots, the Yumi can now push enemies way further back than it used to. It does more damage in general, and will always pierce all enemies. I tried out a run with it, and boy was it some of the most fun I've ever had in Dead Cells for a while. Knocking foes off screen for some reason is just really entertaining for me. It's a good weapon to use with the Tranquility Mutation, but one thing is that because its effect is so unique, it doesn't really work well with some other ranged weapons. Stuff like Throwing Knife and Boomerang can't even begin to match the Yumi's range, but by itself it can prove to be a potent killing machine. You may have seen some shenanigans with the new Yumi where you stunlock bosses, but in the official patch, you can't get any more ammo for the Yumi. So those two shots in the chamber is the most amount of ammo you'll ever have. It can run into some awkward downtime in bosses, so your turrets may have to pick up some of the slack, but this bow does not joke around now. Used to be one of the weakest bows in the game, but now I'm willing to bump it up to B+, and I definitely recommend players to try this out. The Harlight Sword and Gun is the other weapon that I skipped in the melee tier list. This is a crossover weapon with Hyperlight Drifter, and I gotta say, the design behind it feels familiar but fresh. The idea is that you mark enemies with a gun, and then your sword will be able to crit on them. While I think it's possible to invest into either component of the weapon, it'll be easier to run this in a melee setup. Since the buff on the latest patch, this little duo of a weapon can do some serious damage. However, since your setup is a two-handed weapon, it restricts what you can run with it. It's not broken by any means, but I still like it. Still, I'm willing to put it at a comfortable B tier. It's time for some burst damage gameplay, because the heavy crossbow is all about waiting for that perfect moment to ambush foes at point-blank range. While you can shoot the crossbow consecutively, you only get the crit after reloading. As such, my recommended playstyle is to use kill rhythm and just reload after each shot. There's a bit more cooldown between each round, but the damage on the crit can just steamroll any monster in the game. Good incentive to strategize the perfect moment to shoot, and plus, there's always some added utility with root synergy. The damage potential is good enough to bump the heavy crossbow to an A tier. In terms of the tactics archetype, the hemorrhage axe is considered to be one of the slowest. While it's only unlockable on 5 BC, the idea behind it is rather interesting. While the crit condition is the same as the status stiletto, Hemorrhage has the ability to stack its own instance of bleed on the first hit. The only problem is though, because the firing speed is so slow, not critting on the first hit will cause you to lose a large amount of damage in the long run. It has zero crowd control and it's impossible to roll a pierce affix. So if you are running this weapon, I would say you need to have something else that inflicts bleed or poison so you can get crits right away. The sluggish handling of this weapon might take a while to get used to, but if I were to describe this weapon in three words, it's decent, sluggish, and challenging. See it here. Hokuto's Bow. You don't know it yet, but you're already dead. This little weapon really isn't supposed to be run as a main weapon, but as a support that adds a little oomph to your damage. The bow has been the victim of several nerfs in the past, and since the backpack update, people realized you can just put it in the backpack without having it take up a slot in your main loadout, which enabled even more damage output than before. I'm gonna compare this to Corrupted Power in the skills tier list, but this build pretty much synergizes with any fast attacking weapon, or DLT effects. In the past, the general rule is that when you see it, you pick it up. It was so busted that this weapon was not nerfed once, not twice, but three times. Now, it procs the damage buff less often, and has reduced damage overall from before. If I were to nerf this weapon, I would just nerf the damage and move on. 
The internal cooldown on the damage boost hurts this weapon a lot. A lot of the nerfs in the past have just nerfed the weapon's damage slightly, without really killing the weapon per se. But this is probably one of the few instances where I'm willing to say that the nerf has pretty much killed this weapon. I thought I'd never say this, but Hokuto's bow used to be a staple in tactics, but now and mostly can serve as a general support from one of your faster DPS options. Even when run with the Alchemic Carbine and Tesla Coil, two of the highest DPS options in tactics, it's barely able to put a dent in Hand of the King. The problem isn't that the damage is nerfed, the problem is that now Hokuto's bow can't do the one job it's supposed to. Because you literally can't run this as a main weapon, its potential as a damage boost just doesn't do it anymore. As such, it's getting dropped down all the way to B-. The Ice Bow is a cute little alternative to Frost Blast. It fires faster at the price of having less AoE. While I can see how it can be used over Frost Blast, the general consensus is that it's pretty much a downgrade. I can see it being more useful where enemies are not grouped up together or just handling bigger targets altogether. The free status still suffers from being resisted in bosses, so it's not good in 100% of your run. There's also a nifty networking build floating around where you can combo it with Throwing Knife. Still, the difference between deciding to use Frost Blast really comes down to preference, so I'm gonna give it the same tier as Frost Blast, if not slightly lower, which is B-. The Ice Crossbow is probably one of the most overlooked performers in the two-handed weapon department. Despite that I literally just said Freeze isn't as good, the Ice Crossbow is the exception to that. The playstyle is that you freeze enemies in place and unfreeze them with a crit. This means you're most likely to alternate between the two attacks, which means the kill rhythm mutation is a natural fit. What's even more surprising, if you alternate between your two attacks fast enough, you can actually hit bosses while they are still frozen, which means Freeze is actually consistent enough to be useful for your entire run. I do want to warn that the speed delay of kill rhythm scales with the color, so the crossbow is faster when you're approaching the mid slash end game. Definitely give this one another try when you had the chance, because when played right, this crossbow can be a beast of a weapon. And the result of that is a modest A-. The Ice Shorts has fallen from grace quite a good amount ever since Dual Binding was taken out of the game. What used to be a must-have support for slower weapons, now isn't nearly getting utilized much. While it can still be used in cases where you just want to slow something down, or do some synergies with oil, Ice Shorts itself doesn't really do too much damage, and it's mainly used as a stall strategy for whatever it is that you're setting up. And just as Freeze, enemies getting slowed down may mess up your dodge timings. Most of the time, I find shields to be much more effective as a defensive option. Although I don't really use it anymore, it can still hold up decently well in today's age. It's still an A-minus all-around support weapon. So, next up is one of the few ranged weapons in the game that also scales with brutality. When you look at it, it makes perfect sense why it is so. The infantry bow can be played similarly to how you would play a melee weapon. By using tools that allow you to close in the distance, it can be a pretty lethal thing to use. Even though you can use red items, the amount of mutations you can have is just more robust in tactics. It's a weapon that makes the synergies by itself, with pretty good damage to go along with it. A tier for the infantry bow. The Killing Dak is a brand new weapon in the Queen and the Sea DLC. You scatter the cards with the first three hits, and then yank all the cards back to you on the fourth, dealing crits. As a ranged weapon that only skills with tactics and one that's introduced with already so much competition out there, the deck has to perform really well. And really well it does. The crit it deals on the fourth hit has the potential to do so much damage, you'll need to check your eyes. The only problem is, since the cards seem to have minds of their own and don't actually fire in the exact direction you want, your attacks can whiff if you fire them from far away meaning the best strategy is to get in as close as possible before scattering the cards. It's a high-risk, high-reward weapon to use, but if you're a seasoned veteran of tactics, you shouldn't have any trouble of using it. However, given that the killing deck alone has a bit of trouble holding up, I think it barely falls shy of being an S tier. So, I think A plus is a comfortable spot. The Lightning Bolt is a weird weapon in Dead Cells. Similarly to Fire Blast, you hold down the attack button to deal damage in bursts. After holding down the button for a little while, the bolt will crit, 
Then after the bolt turns red, you will start to take damage too. However, they did buff the amount of time before you hurt yourself, so the handling is a bit easier than before. Depending on your preferred playstyle, this can be a nightmare to use, especially being one of the few weapons that can actually hurt you in the process. Still with some decent damage support, the Lightning Bolt can shine fairly well. Given its entry fee of needing to get used to its handling, it's still a fairly solid A tier weapon with some potential. Brand new to the arsenal, the Magic Bow is the crossover weapon from Soul Knight that has only recently entered the spotlight. If you played Hades, it's essentially the aspect of Kyra on the Heart Seeking Bow, where you fire multiple arrows and they automatically home in on targets. It's the same principle in Dead Cells, the only difference is that the shots themselves come out after a short pause, and the speed of the arrows are slower than what you may expect. It's a fantastic tool to keep flying enemies at bay, but against grounded targets, I find that you have to fire the bow a short distance away without your arrows being confused. However, I would say that due to its slower draw speed, you're gonna need a pierce enemy affix on it to make it a bit more consistent when dealing with crowds. I would also see a damage buff as I think the current version is not quite there yet to be at the top. Still, B tier is a decent placement for this newcomer. Playing magic missiles is what it feels like to have aimbot in Dead Cells. You can spam the attack button or hold it down to fire it in rapid succession. There's no crit condition, but that also doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. With insane auto-targeting skills, you can pull off some shenanigans with Wings of the Crow or anything that manipulates your movement. You can watch as your enemies gasp in awe as you float above them in a cloud of lightning while you blast away in safety. Look at these peasants, they don't stand a chance. With this strategy, you can cheese some bosses altogether. Now that's some good gameplay. Since you really don't have to worry about running the magic missiles with anything specific, just look out for some good affixes and you're pretty much set. Due to its versatility yet simplistic design, A tier is as high as I'm willing to put it at. There are two sides to the marksman's bow. You either deal a lot of damage if you crit, or next to nothing if you don't. And boy, it was one of the most terrifying experiences I have ever had. So the Marksman's Bow has the opposite crit condition as the Infantry Bow, but having a foe far away from you is way harder to do than having them close by. There are a couple ways to achieve this. You can use the War Javelin or the recently reworked Gilded Yumi to push foes away, and use Tranquility, one of the mutations, to fully take advantage of that. The problem is, there will be a couple scenarios where it's really hard to practice social distancing, like the case with some stubborn elites and bosses. Because the weapon itself is geared towards to you critting every time, when you don't crit, you're in trouble, especially when you run out of ammo. It's because of this that I died once in my attempt at using it, and even then, I got carried somewhat by OP turrets. While it's still possible to win, just be careful of trying out the Marksman's Vote, because you are in for a challenge. It's a C tier weapon. Careful, impulsive spenders, because the money shooter has your wallet in its grip. This slingshot will launch a powerful gold nugget, at the expense of your own gold count. 150 to be exact. Now, something I've noticed is that if you just use the money shooter at will, you actually can't sustain yourself. Meaning, if you don't have some other backup weapons or ways to deal damage, you will run out of gold if you keep using it. There are a couple ways to circumvent this. The new mutations that came with the bank update, Gold Digger or Greed Shield. There's also support for it, but even then, how much gold are you willing to sacrifice in order to deal extra damage? I'm not questioning the numbers this little slingshot deals because it gets pretty insane. Alternatively, just put this in the backpack and you only use it for bosses. On top of that, the 150 fee to fire the money shooter is actually more expensive than you think. You'll hear me mention this with some of the future items in this video, but having the pierced enemy affix is pretty much a must to really make this work. If you defeat two enemies in one go, that effectively means you only have to pay 75 gold for each kill. Now, I can't just tell you, just keep resetting your game until you get a money shooter with the pierce affix, because that's not really realistic. Though the affix itself is not really hard to come by. There's some strict entry fees for this weapon, but because the damage is so incredible if you manage to make it work, it's A tier. Multiple Nox Bow the weapon that started it all. In the 2.3 update, I used this weapon to pretty much break the game with the Barbed Tips mutation. Not only is this unlocked right from the get-go, for some reason, even without a crit condition, the damage is still really relevant even in 5 BC. 
If you get a Pierce affix, the game is pretty much trivial. There's not too much to say about it since it is just a good ranged weapon by default. There's a little bit of complexity as the shot takes a small windup to fire, so some practice might be needed. But just for its sheer damage output, it is as high as S-. minus. Yes, the damage is that good. Just like the Money Shooter, it's pretty much a must to have the Pierce enemy affix on the Nerves of Steel. The gimmick is quite simple. Hold and release the fire button at the exact timing when the bow glows to deal a critical hit. Once you get used to it a fair amount, you'll be landing crits left and right. The only problem is that it takes a little while before the bow glows, and while it's not an issue if you're fighting things one-on-one, -on -one, it may be a little too slow for crowds. That's why you'll need the Pierce affix on it. Again, I can't just tell you to keep resetting your game until one with that FX shows up, but when it does, the damage gets pretty insane. The crits are capable of one-shotting every type of enemy in the game, in the late game biomes, and even then, it handles quite well in bosses. It's offset a little bit by its monotonous playstyle and the one-dimensional learning curve, the Nurse of Steel lands at A tier. Pyrotechnics is like Fire Blast's twin brother. The crit condition is exactly the same. The general mechanics is also exactly the same. I really think which one you pick comes down to personal preference. However, from a pure damage perspective, Fire Blast has Pyrotechnics beat. I would say this has little to add to the table, so long as Fire Blast exists. I do have to add that there's no ranged weapon in the game that applies oil from far away, so you're gonna have to close in on foes first. As such, I'm willing to rate it one tier lower than Fire Blast, which is A-. The Quick Bow is as vanilla as they come. Similarly to the multiple knocks, the playstyle for the Quick Bow is fairly straightforward. Hold down attack to rapid fire, get your usual suspects of damage supporters like Boomerang or Throwing Knife, and just pair it up with some good skills. It's nothing new once you play tactics for a while, but this bow can help beginners understand how tactics is meant to be played. Good overall weapon, doesn't do anything too unique, still a decent B tier, even at 5 BC. So we've arrived at the last of the two-handed crossbows. The repeater crossbow specializes in root, and luckily the kit itself comes with an arrow barrage that roots things already pre-installed. Of course, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit more insurance with skills that root, or a boy's axe in the backpack to keep the damage consistent. But this was a weapon that I used to melt Timekeeper with. I realized they nerfed the damage a little bit in the latest patch, but this thing still doesn't joke around. Aside from the fact that it can work in both tactics and survival, and the pure amount of shenanigans you can do with it, I'm willing to give the Repeater Crossbow an esteemed S-tier rating. The Sonic Carbine is one of the rarer weapons in the game. If you manage to unlock it, albeit through the extremely strict requirements, you probably found a lot of success with it. Since it fires so fast, you can take advantage with a lot of synergies, like Instinct, Barbed Tips, or Root to keep enemies in one place. In fact, even if you can't crit, the damage was so good, this weapon also got a slight damage nerf in the last patch. Does that mean it's out of commission? Not necessarily. The only thing I would say that its biggest downside is running out of ammo. Since critting is not possible on most bosses, you're gonna have to need some way to get your arrows back to continue your onslaught. Other than that, still a pretty solid ranged option. Again, A- tier is a fair placement. Yes, the full title of this weapon is The Boy's Axe, hence why it starts with a T. Don't ask me why. You probably heard me talk about this axe quite a bit earlier in the video, and that's because this is genuinely one of the best support weapons you can have in the game. If Snake Fangs is the best designed melee weapon, then The Boy's Axe is a close contender for the ranged counterpart. Apart from being really reliable at rooting enemies, including bosses, you can use it with the Ripper mutation, as ripping out the axe counts as removing an arrow. You can use it in the backpack for some extra rooting potential. So many ways to use it, and probably one of the best designed weapons to this day. While it did get a nerf now that the ammo mutation can't work with it anymore, but coupled by a pretty amazing damage for a support weapon, it still lands at S tier. The throwing knife is like the bleed counterpart to the firebrand. Instead of fire, it's bleed fast firing, and inflicts a certain status effect. It used to be pretty busted when dual binding was a thing, but pressing two buttons instead of one takes away a lot of the consistency. I'll give it the same rating as Firebrand, if not slightly higher, because there's some pretty good affixes that can elevate the throwing knife quite well. A decent B-plus support weapon. 
The War Javelin has one of the most unique mechanics for ranged weapons. You can throw the spear itself, pushing back anything in its path, and then you'll have to run and retrieve it, or press the attack button again to teleport instantly to the javelin. This can create some interesting applications, like pushing foes out of range to crit with the marksman's bow, or just any build that utilizes the tranquility mutation. You can also try speedrunning with it, but I don't factor in speedrunning utility in my ratings. While it doesn't do too much damage, the interesting way to use it certainly has piqued my interest to this day. I'm still scratching my head brainstorming the interesting ways to use it, because it is just such a strange weapon. It's not too effective on its own, and it really comes down to personal preference, but I'll need to put it in C tier just for the fringe potential it currently has. Alright, there we have it, all the ranged weapons in version 3.0 of Dead Cells. Hopefully you found these insights to be helpful in guiding you what to look for when playing these weapons. This series of tier lists is by far the most difficult videos I have made on the channel, so if you would kindly drop a like on the video, it would really help me out. That's it, just a small button press. And remember, this tier list is subjective, and all strategies are viable. What doesn't work for me doesn't exactly mean that it's also not going to work for you. In fact, if you manage to find a quirky build that no one has talked about before or any suggestions or comments in general, make sure to drop it down below. And I will see you all finally for the skills tier list. After over a year and a half, I'm finally ready to do a new one. So, until then, have a good rest of the day, and thank you for watching.